Well, let's see how you like this then, Sadiq Khan. Let's begin. <laughs> Of course, as we all know, Ulez is um, a spectacle where cars tremble and wallets weep. Well, the genius of it all, eh? Because nothing screams of environmental revolution like slapping a fine on Bob, the unsuspecting commuter who's just trying to get from point A to point B without sacrificing his firstborn. But don't worry, because now we have the brilliant revelation from Nigel Farage. Our knight in shining armour appears with this. Waving the Greater London Authority Act 1999 like a majestic sword of justice. Behold, he declares, Article 143 where the Secretary of State can swoop down from the heavens and override Sadiq Khan's grand plan if it is detrimental to areas outside Greater London. Which, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing that Sadiq Khan, or Sad IQ Khan as I like to call him, might have just forgotten about that lovely little bit of legislation. But then of course as well we've got the Tories considering a move to stop Ulysses expansion as well. All of course in the name of protecting us unfortunate souls living beyond the city limits. And to be honest in my opinion there's just no point in all this Ulysses crap to begin with. Because if they actually cared about environmental health or environmental protection or whatever they want to call it. They'd surely pedestrianise the whole area wouldn't they and not let any cars go down there whatsoever. Rather than of course fining people if their car isn't new enough to meet the modern day requirements. And if Sadiq Khan's not careful this could be his end do it. Hopefully it will be. Yes! Anyway, the article says that a bloke called Mark Harper could block Sadiq Khan from expanding the London ultra-low emission zone, ULES, Nigel Farage has revealed. On his GB News show this evening, Mr Farage read Article 143 from the Greater London Authority Act 1999, which says, in black and white, the Secretary of State can override the Mayor of London on transport policy if the Secretary considers that this strategy, or any part of it, is inconsistent with national policies and, of course, detrimental to any area outside Greater London. Mr Farage said the move would be a no-brainer for the Tories, especially given Labour has a handful of seats on the outskirts of the capital that will be hit by Sadiq Khan's expansion. And on the second point of legislation, he said that it has already been absolutely confirmed that ULES will hurt areas outside London. There are so many people with businesses in counties outside London that will be adversely affected by ULES expansion. But the crux of the problem, Mr Farage explained, is the first point made by Article 143. What is our transport policy? But if the government is now saying it's against this ULES extension and against it happening in other cities, I can't see what the problem is. I think politically it's a no-brainer for the Conservatives to delay the introduction of ULES and to push it out beyond the mayoral elections next May. But GB News political editor downplayed hopes of a government intervention on the matter. However, saying sources close to the Transport Secretary told him they weren't going to take up the challenge of blocking the extension legally. Well, why not? It just doesn't make any sense, does it? And Christopher Hope said that whilst the legislation is there in the 1990 bill, it's a question of how you define it. Of course, they did seem to have a problem with that with Brexit, didn't they? A lot of Ramonas did anyway. The rest of us kind of understood what Brexit meant. But anyway... Well, it's such a delight, isn't it, to know that our British homes are being turned into impromptu Airbnb accommodations for those adventurous burglars. I mean, who wouldn't want an unexpected guest rifling through their personal belongings every 116 seconds? It's practically a dream come true, isn't it? But, you know, don't worry, people, because despite the dramatic surge in crime, our fearless police forces have managed to solve a whopping 23% of those daring escapades. Bravo, well done, but who needs Sherlock Holmes when we have our own bungling investigators, eh? And of course, let's not forget the massive 4% of these cases actually result in in charges. Is this what you heard that right? 4%? I mean, with odds like that, you kind of got a better chance of winning the lottery whilst being struck by lightning, haven't you? It's almost just like the police are playing a game of hide-and-seek with the burglars and the homeowners are the unfortunate spectators. But don't worry, because Home Secretary Suella Braverman has come to the rescue with a brilliant plan. She wants to reduce police paperwork so that they can actually focus on more important matters, like practising the donut eating, for example, and, of course, perfecting the art of napping in their patrol cars, and I'm sure some woke policy is going to be down there at some point during the line, isn't it? But because let's face it, nothing says crime prevention like skipping paperwork, does it? And of course sending an actual policeman to every burglary. I mean, I can already see the police 
Usman now, can't you? Donning capes and leaping over the fences in a single bound. And who, of course, who can forget the enlightened compassion of burglary rates into summer vacations? It's like saying, hey folks, while you're busy sipping pina coladas on the beach, our friendly neighbourhood burglars will be making themselves at home in our living rooms. I mean, don't forget to leave out some snacks for them. Of course, yeah, I don't know about you, but I personally think a 4% success rate in actually charging people is not good enough at all. It just makes a whole mockery of the situation, doesn't it? That's not what we pay our council tax for at the end of the day, is it? We expect results and we expect things to get done and it bloody well should be. Anyway, the article says that British homes were broken into every 116 seconds over the last year, meaning a shocking average of 756 daily burglaries are leaving homeowners heartbroken and traumatised. New figures obtained by the Daily Express show that 275,919 cases of burglaries were reported in the year ending March 2023, meaning at least one home is broken into in less than every two minutes. Yet despite the soaring crime wave, a staggering 213,279 burglaries went unsolved by police and an average of 564 a day, accounting for almost 77% of all cases. And of those cases, police forces only charge suspects in 4% of burglary cases. Some forces have privately admitted to only doing the bare minimum to investigate crimes deemed low level, but ministers have demand change, and I think so as well. Home Secretary Suella Braverman has announced plans to reduce police paperwork and wants forces to use the time to increase patrols and investigations. And that comes as forces promised to send an officer to all burglaries. Well, about time too. And the new analysis of the Home Office data looked at the latest release of police recorded crimes across England and Wales to establish the frequency of residential break-ins to identify areas most at risk of being targeted by thieves this summer. Birmingham saw the most burglaries last year, with 7,104 recorded cases, at a rate of once every 72 minutes in the city. Almost among the most targeted areas was Leeds, which saw a break-in occur every two hours, and Sheffield, which saw a home targeted by thieves once in every two hours and 40 minutes. The research conducted by A-Plan Insurance suggests that these areas will need to be particularly cautious as the rate of break-ins increase by almost a fifth, 19% from mid-July to late August when compared to the rest of the year. And some cities saw an even bigger increase such as Coventry which saw cases rise by a whopping 34% during the school holidays last year and Peterborough with cases rising by 27%. Well, isn't that just a fantastic revelation that apparently the BBC is about as hip and happening as inside in our pair of crochet slippers? It seems that they've been so wrapped up in their tea and crumpets that they've forgotten the golden rule of impressing the young'uns to be cool as a cucumber in the snowstorm. And how naive of them to think that the younger generation would be dazzled by any vintage charm that they think they have whilst they're busy binging on Netflix and YouTube sipping their avocado smoothies. But unfortunately for the BBC, it appears that the youth have spoken and the BBC's popularity has plummeted faster than a lead balloon in a hurricane. I mean, they've been ousted from what they think is their coolness, landing all the way down to 71st place in the hip organisation rankings. But of course, they do have things like the mighty EastEnders and... I know the race across the world to try and keep the youth entertained. But in all honesty, the BBC strategy, in my opinion, isn't exactly doing too well with that. And I think they actually take the TV licence for granted. And if anything, they're forgetting that they actually need to impress the younger generation who are more likely to watch streaming services rather than traditional live TV. Especially in an age where, in my opinion, the TV licence is extremely outdated. The alcohol says that the BBC is a turn-off for young people who are more thrilled with streaming sites and supermarkets. A survey found that they preferred Greg's, Sainsbury's and Ikea, and despite a drive to attract a younger audience, in which popular older TV and radio presenters have been replaced with hosts in their 20s and 30s, the BBC is still seen as uncool, yay! Because it is, in my opinion. It has fallen to the 71st place in the league of the top 100 hip organisations, a poll in which 60,000 kids found. Auntie, as they are so often called, experienced the biggest slump in the coolness of all recognised organisations from 2022 to 2023, fallen 28 places in the league table of cool firms topped by Netflix and, of course, YouTube. Helena Gilmore of Beano Brain, the consultancy wing of the Beano Comics, which conducted the research, said that younger people mention the BBC or iPlayer very infrequently. She added, 
BBC Kids and teen shows don't have the same buzz amongst kids and Netflix shows. And the BBC was warned in 2019 by Ofcom, the media watchdog, that it risked losing younger viewers to rivals like Netflix and Amazon Prime. Apparently, bosses of the corporation then embarked on a lurch to youth to attract the ages 16 to 34 market, with BBC relaunched with trendy content, apparently, produced for channels 1 and 2. New programmes were launched, including a spin-off of Matches of the Day called MOTD, a mixture of football, music and culture. But the 7 to 14 cohort are more likely to watch TV with a parent, and a good old-fashioned EastEnders and Race the World were more popular with them than targeted youth programmes, the survey found. And in 2022, Tim Davey, the Director General, announced that the lurch to youth would be abandoned after it was found that the BBC were losing older viewers fed up with a policy. Watchdog Ofcom found that over 55s were switching to Netflix and other streaming services because they were irritated with the broadcaster's new direction. The BBC was apparently named the 43rd coolest brand among 7 to 14 year olds in the name survey in 2022, but of course has since fallen all the way down since the 70s. But then again in this video, Kia Sama has apparently been putting massive pressure onto the carnival, something that I'm sure we could all do without.